إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So let's continue today with الأجوبة المفيدة عن أسئلة المناهج الجديدة في شيخ الفوزان حفظه الله تعالى Let's begin with question number 12 that was put to Sheikh Al-Fawzan. The question is, <coughs> are these, these jama'at, these groups and parties that are present today, do they enter into the 72 sects that are destroyed? So the Sheikh, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he mentioned in his answer, he said, Naam. He said, yes. All of those or whomsoever opposes the opposes Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah among those who ascribe themselves to Islam in Da'wah or in the Aqeedah or in anything from the foundations of Iman, then he is included. And he is counted among the 72 sects. And he is encompassed by the threat of the fire. And there is for him rebuke and censure and punishment according to his level of opposition. So that answer is fairly clear and no doubt in line with that which we have already mentioned regarding the division of the ummah that the 72 sects, that they are those who oppose the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum. Just as Allah has, said, has mentioned in the Qur'an or stated in the Qur'an, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِي رَسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَعْتَبِي غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمَ وَسَاءَتْ مَسِيرًا That whomsoever contradicts the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the clear guidance has been conveyed to him and then he follows a path he follows a path other than the path of the Sahaba عنهم, then Allah will leave him in the path that he has chosen and burn him in the hellfire so that proves that whomsoever opposes the sunnah of Allah's messenger وسلم, and the way of the believers the first of the believers being the Sahaba عنهم, then that person is a person who is threatened with the fire and, dis- and, and burning in the fire. And likewise, the hadith of the 73 sects, the well-known hadith, that all of them are into the hellfire except for one. So, <clears throat> any sect and any person who opposes Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, meaning from those who are within the Da'ira of Al-Islam, so they are the Ummatu Da'wah, meaning that they responded and they became Muslim or that they were born into Muslim families so they are Ahlul Islam so if they oppose the da'wah meaning that which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ahlul Sunnah the Sahaba that that which they were upon in in da'wah in aqeedah in anything from the usul of the deen in anything from the usul of iman meaning the aqeedah and the foundations of the religion, then he is counted amongst the 72 sects. So he is, he comes under the threat of Allah's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment, as in the hadith of the 73 sects. So there is only one that is saved, and they are those upon that which the Prophet sallam and his sahaba radiallahu anhum were upon. And that is only one sect, they are not numerous. There is no division within them and there is no deviation within that one sect. It does not mean, of course, that 
those who ascribe themselves to that sect and they follow the aqidah and they're upon the that which the the, the aqidah of salafiyya and even the method, the methodology of of, of salafiyya it doesn't mean that they are sinless it doesn't necessitate that they are free from fault because you can find a sunni who sins a sunni who may fornicate a sunni who may listen to music he's salafi but he falls into these kabair so he is threatened with Allah's punishment due to the kabair due to him falling into sin however as far as his aqidah is concerned his methodology is concerned his view and his vision of the kitab and the sunnah and its understanding then that is in line with what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his sahaba were upon so it doesn't necessitate that just because someone is from ahlu sunnati wal jama'a that he is sinless it doesn't mean that nor does it mean that he will not be punished in the grave nor does it mean that he will not be punished in the hereafter if he committed or if he fell into a kabira min al kabair if he fell into a sin from the major sins so no one should feel safe and this is why the sahaba radiyallahu anhum that they never felt safe from the punishment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is why the likes of uthman and umar and abu bakr that they used to cry over their or what they considered to be their deficiencies they used to cry over it and as uh, ibn ibn abi mulaika radiyallahu rahimahullah ta'ala from the tabi'in he said that i met such and such a number of the sahaba and all of them used to fear hypocrisy for themselves that they used to fear that they may have fallen into a branch from the branches of hypocrisy so therefore just because we say that we adhere to the manhaj of the salaf and the aqidah of salafiyyah and our tawheed is sound and in all of these affairs we have certainty a salafi is not in doubt with regard to his tawheed or with regard to his methodology with regard to his aqidah with regard to the matters of the unseen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us of in the Quran but that does, that does not mean that we are free from falling into errors and short, shortcomings and sins so therefore adhere to the manhaj of the salaf adhere to the aqidah of the salaf adhere also to the behavior and the conduct and the manners and the akhlaq of the salaf and the adab of the salaf because they were the most pious of people and that's why they referred to as the salaf salihin are they not they are referred to as the righteous predecessors why are they referred to as the righteous or pious predecessors because they were pious and they were righteous in terms of their obedience to Allah and in terms of their piety in terms of their wara and their desire to be near to Allah and their ibadah so they the sahaba radiyallahu anhum and those who followed their way truly then they follow the way of the salaf in terms of their usul their aqidah their manhaj their love of rasulullah and their love of following the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam obeying Allah and his messenger and keeping away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from so all of that encompasses safety from the hellfire but as for the 72 sects then when we refer to the 72 sects we are talking about the sects who deviated in the usul of the deen and the, uh, and the aqidah and the methodology such as the khawarij and the shia and the mu'tazila and the qadariya and the jabariya and the murji'a and the uh, you know the people of falsafa the, the those who follow the the philosophical uh, you know the various philosophical schools of thought and likewise those who fell into kalam ahlul kalam and other than them so they are the ones who deviated in this era in, in these arenas as for those who deviated to such a degree that it nullified their islam completely like the extreme shia or the extreme jahmiyyah and like the ghullat amongst the jahmiyyah and likewise the, the the extreme sufia and the people of falsafa the philosophers who went to extremes and they negated allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they nullified their belief in allah then they are outside of the 72 sects they are outside of that they are amongst the people of kufr and shirk so when we talk about the 72 sects that we are referring to those people who ascribe themselves to Islam and they are considered as Muslims but deviated and therefore we say that whoever falls into the 72 sects and remember there is one saved sect and that is referred to as Firqatun Najiyah 
So if it falls into the 72 deviated sects, then we say that they are not in the hellfire forever, but rather we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them or that he threatens them with punishment and their deviation has led them to earn the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for question number, or the next question, question 13, <clears throat> the question that was put to Sheikh Al-Fawzan, <clears throat> is the one, man tasamma bis salafi, that the one who calls himself a salafi, is he considered a hizbi, mutahaziban? Is he considered a person of partisanship, meaning partisan to a sect? Then, <clears throat> meaning that the, that the question, of course, revolves around the usage of the term Salafi. Is it allowed to call yourself Salafi? And is it a term that actually falls into the same partisanship that we are warning against? That sectarianism that divides the Muslim Ummah that we warn against and that we speak against and we call to the unity of the Muslim Ummah upon the correct Aqeedah, upon Salafiyyah, upon the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that by calling yourself Salafi, does, not, does that not put you into the same thing that you're warned against, i.e. partisanship and splitting and dividing? So Sheikh Al-Fawzan, he answers <clears throat> that, that as for calling oneself Salafi, or using the tasmiyah of Salafiyya, then if calling oneself Salafi, if it is true, meaning that the ascription is a true ascription, then there is no harm in that. However, if it is a mere claim, it is a person just claiming to be a Salafi, then it is not allowed for him to, to label himself as a Salafi with the tasmiyah, as a tasmiyah of Salafiyyah, while he is upon other than the manhaj of the Salaf. Meaning that if you're going to call yourself a Salafi, then it is not just a name that you're using, but rather this name or this title is backed up by a reality. And that reality is that you are upon the path and the manhaj of the Salaf of this Ummah. Then he said, as for the Asha'ira, for example, and the Asha'ira are those who are upon the madhab of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari prior to his repentance. So they are in reality upon the madhab of Abdullah ibn Kullab. And these are, <coughs> this methodology or this doctrine calls to the denial or the misinterpretation of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they deviated in the names and attributes of Allah and that's the discussion in itself. So this sect that is known as the, as the, as the Ash'ariya or the Ash'aira, then they say, نَحْنُ أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ They say that we are Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this is not correct. Because, because that which they are upon, then it is not from the methodology or their methodology is not the methodology of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Likewise, the Mu'tazila, who call themselves Muwahideen. And yet, in reality, they are not people of Tawheed, the Mu'tazila, because they deny the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with respect to his names and attributes. And they don't, and, and they don't understand Tawheed al-Uluhiyya or Tawheed al-Ibadah as it should be understood. So therefore, just because the Asha'ira call themselves Ahlu Sunnah does not make them Ahlu Sunnah. The Mu'tazila who are the followers of Wasil bin Ata, who give precedence to the intellect over the revelation, and they regard one's rational processes of the mind or the logic and rationale of the mind, they regard it to be superior and to be given precedence over the text of the Kitab and the Sunnah. So they call themselves Muwahideen. They call themselves people of Tawheed, but they are not people of Tawheed. In fact, they, re they reject the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Mu'tazila in totality. So just because they call themselves Muwahideen or that the Ashaira call themselves Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah does not mean that they are deserving of the title. Then Sheikh Al-Fawzan mentions uh, a line of poetry 
we're in. He stated that everyone claims to be or everyone claims to have a connection to Layla, but Layla does not acknowledge it for any of them. And this is referring to uh, two lovers in, in the times of the ancient Arabs or the, or the Arabs of old. And there was Layla and Qais. And because of the nobility and the, no, and, and, the, and, the in, and the and the fame of Layla and her beauty that everyone claimed to be a lover of Layla. Everyone claimed to ascribe or everyone claimed ascription to Layla. But Layla did not acknowledge any of them. Layla did not acknowledge any of them. So Sheikh Al-Fawzan mentions here these lines, everyone claims to have a connection to Layla, but Layla does not acknowledge the connection of any of them. So the one who claims that he is upon the madhab of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, then he must follow the path of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah and, and abandon those who oppose the, the path of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. As for the person who wishes to gather between the lizard and the fish, as they say, i.e., that he wishes to unite the creatures of the desert with the creatures of the sea, then that is not possible. Or he wishes to gather fire and water in the same hand, then this is not possible. It is not possible to unite Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah with the beliefs of those who are their opposers, such as the Khawarij, the Mu'tazila, and the Hizbis from those who call themselves the modern Muslims or the modernist Muslims. They wish to unite the misguidance and deviations of the people of these times with the manhaj of the Salaf, meaning that that is not possible. However, as the statement of Imam Malik goes, the latter part of this ummah will not be rectified except by that which rectified its earliest part. So in summary, it is a must that the affairs are distinguished and made clear, meaning between truth and falsehood. So the purpose, going back to the beginning of this question, so the purpose behind calling oneself Salafi or ascribing to Salafi is to distinguish the people of truth from the people of falsehood. Why do we call ourselves Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah? Because we are all Muslims. So why distinguish with the term Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah? Because Ahlu Sunnah are distinguished from Ahlul Bid'ah. The Jama'ah are distinguished from those who split up and they divide. So Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, that the Sunnah and the Jama'ah, that they come together, just as Bid'ah and Furqa come together. So it is said, Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, or it is said, Ahlu Bid'ah wal Furqa, just as it is said, Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah, meaning that, that the people of Bid'ah are opposed to the Sunnah. So they are called Ahlu Bid'ah. They are not followers of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or that they only follow the, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in that which agrees with their desires and they reject the sunnah when it opposes their desires and whims. And they are people of furqa, they are people of division because when you split from the sunnah and you split from the, then you have split from the jama'ah and they are the sahaba or the path of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. So they are called ahlul bid'ah wal furqa, the people of, the people of innovation and division. Whereas ahlul sunnati wal jama'ah are the people of the Sunnah and the people of the main body that is united upon the Kitab and the Sunnah and the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So the purpose of these titles such as Sunni or Salafi or Athari or Ahlul Hadith or Ahlul Athar, then all of these titles are designed and were used by the early Salaf to distinguish the people of truth from the people of falsehood. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah stated in his Majmu al-Fatawa, volume 4, page 149. He said, لا عيب ألا من أذهر مذهب السلف That there is no criticism upon the one who makes manifest the madhab of the salaf, meaning the doctrine or the manhaj of the salaf. 
وانتسب إليه واعتز إليه أن he ascribes himself to it and he affiliates himself to it meaning that he calls himself Salafi so this is the intisab وانتسب meaning وانتسب meaning that he ascribes himself to it by calling himself Salafi and he affiliates to it so there is no criticism upon such a person بَلْ يَجِبُ قُبُولُ ذَلِكْ مِنْهُ بِالْاتِفَاقِ Rather, that is to be accepted from him by consensus, by agreement. فَإِنَّ مَذْهَبَ السَّلَفْ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا حَقَّ For indeed, the methodology or the madhab of the salaf is not accept the truth. So therefore, in the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, we have a clear proof from one of the aima of the Salaf that to use the term Salaf or Salafi or Salafiya and to have intisab to it meaning to affiliate oneself to it and ascribe to it is accepted by the ittifaq or by the consensus and agreement of the Ummah بَلْ يَجِبُ قُبُولُ ذَلِكَ as he said rather it is obligatory to accept that from him so the one who calls himself Salafi it is not permissible for a person to criticize him for it <clears throat> Likewise, in the notes or in the footnotes, Sheikh, Sheikh Jamal al Harithi, rahimahullah, he said, So ponder, my brother, O reader, hear the speech of Sheikh al Islam, the speech that he made or that he penned down eight centuries ago, or the speech of Sheikh al Islam from eight centuries ago or eight generations ago. Eight centuries in reality because he died in 728 after the Hijra, over seven centuries ago. It is as if he is refuting, it is as if he is refuting some of the people of this age, from these times. From them is the one who said, whomsoever obligates upon the people that he be an ikhwani, or Salafi, or Tablighi, or Sururi, then he should be commanded to repent. And if he does not, then he is to be executed. And this was the saying of Aid al Qarni from a tape that he entitled Firra min al Khizbiya, Firaraka, Firaraka min al Asad. Flee from partisanship as you would flee from a lion. So in this statement, Aid al-Qarni, he has opposed Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and he has opposed the sayings of the Salaf because the Salaf would accept the usage of the term Salafi. Furthermore, in his ignorance that he has used the term Salafi alongside Ikhwani and Tablighi and Sururi who are all innovators as if the Salafi is an innovator like the Ikhwani or the Tablighi or the Sururi. Whereas Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said that the madhab of the Salaf is nothing except the truth. So how can you compare the Salafi who follows the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to the Ikhwani who follows the Khariji Ash'ari teachings of Hassan al-Banna or the Tablighi who follows the teachings of Muhammad Ilyas Kandahlawi, the Sufi, or the teachings of the Sururi, the follower of Muhammad Zainuddin, Muhammad Zainuddin Abedin, or Muhammad Surur Zainul Abedin, this revolutionary, all of them from the 20th century, from this century that we are in, or the century that preceded this century. So he, so he uses the term Salafi alongside these terminologies. Then Sheikh Jamal al Harithi, rahimahullah, he said, however, later Aid al Qarni wrote some notes recanting and repenting from, from his saying that he, that he said in this audio that was made widespread. However, he said, it is known with Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a that the retraction of a person of innovation or a person who falls into bid'ah should be from all of his errors, not just a portion of them, not just one of them. And this is the way that you see sometimes, my brothers and sisters, Ahlul Bid'a. 
that they will always push the boundaries in terms of their bid'ah and their extremism. Up until that there is enough push back against them that they recant. But they won't recant from their usul and from their methodologies and from their false ideologies. Rather the point that they have been criticized for, they will take that back. But they will not take back the methodology that they are upon and the bid'ah that they are upon as a whole. And this is why Sheikh Jamali mentions, however, it is known with Ahlul Sunnah that retraction is from all of your errors, all of one's errors, and not just a portion of them or one of them. And he should write that he accepts all of his mistakes and all of his deviations and then pen down what is correct and then return to the truth and then make that open and public such that everyone sees it. And not that you just write something obscure, that it is written on, on some, some obscure notes that none but a few people have seen. And then what you take back is only just one sentence, just like he took back this one sentence. When he said that those people, whosoever obligates upon the people, they be an ikhwani or salafi or tabligi or sururi. So he just took that sentence back. Then what about the rest of your deviations? He didn't take them back. So now he wants everyone to thank him that he has repented. But in reality, that is not a repentance. Except that he has retracted that one or those, that one sentence that he made. What about the rest of his errors? So pay attention to this affair, my brothers and sisters, that when people claim, oh, Fulan has retracted, Fulan has repented. What is he repented from? From a sentence or all of his usul, bid'iyah? All of his principles that are founded upon bid'ah. Oh, he made that comment, but he's retracted from that. And he made that comment, he's retracted from that. Then what about the whole of your error that is built upon a methodology that is fraudulent and in opposition to the sunnah? For this reason, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned in Uddatul Sabirin, page 93 and 94, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said, from the conditions of repentance of the caller to bid'ah, is that he makes clear that which he used to call to from innovation and misguidance. So the one, this is from the conditions of the repentance of a caller to innovation. He makes clear that which he used to call to from innovation and misguidance. That's the first thing. So he makes a i'tiraf. He says, this is what I used to call to and it is innovation, it is misguidance, it is rooted or it is based upon the ideology of such and such group of people or such and such a sect and I make that clear and then he makes clear Ibn Qayyim mentions and that guidance is opposite is its opposite meaning that true guidance is the opposite of that which he used to be upon just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down the conditions of repentance for the people of the book whose sin whose sin was concealing that which Allah had revealed of clarification and guidance so as to misguide the people as Allah has said except for those who repent and they rectify and they make their affair clear so those are the three things that they have to do so this is why he said here Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah just as Allah has laid down the conditions of repentance for the people of book of the book whose sin was concealing that which Allah had revealed of clarification and guidance so as to misguide the people. So they had to rectify their deeds in their souls and to clarify to the people that which they concealed from them. So likewise here, the, rep the one who repents from his innovation, that he makes clear that which he was upon of deviation. Then he makes clear that that which, he, that which is the truth is opposite to that which he was upon. And then he makes that apparent to the people makes bayan of that the great scholar Muwafiquddin Ibn Qudama rahimahullah who was the author of Al-Mughni in Fiqh and Lu'matul Itiqad in Aqeedah died in the year 620 so he wrote a refutation against Abu Al-Wafa Ibn Aqil one of the scholars so Ibn Qudama said, I looked into the book 
Al-Fadiha of Ibn Aqil, which he entitled Al-Nasiha. Al-Fadiha meaning that, so he changed the name of his book. His book was called Al-Nasiha, Ibn Aqil's. So Ibn Qudama said, I looked into the book Al-Fadiha, which means the disgrace, which Ibn Aqil entitled Al-Nasiha. And I considered that which it contains of ugly innovations and hideous oppositions against the clear, unobstructed path of the Sunnah. And I found it to be a scandalous disgrace upon the one who uttered it. And due to it, Allah exposed the corruption that he had concealed. And had he not repented to Allah, the mighty and majestic, and freed himself, recanted and returned back from that, and had he not sought Allah's forgiveness from all of that which he had said of innovations, all of that which he had said of innovations, and that which he had written with his own hand, or that which he had authored, or that which, he had, which was ascribed to him, we would have counted him amongst the heretics and the renegade innovators. However, Ibn Qudama mentions with a connected chain of narration. He said, however, he repented, meaning Ibn Aqil repented. Having said, this is the words of Ibn Aqil. He said, I free myself before Allah the Most High from the madhabs of the innovators, Ali Atizal, from the Mu'tazila, and from accompanying their leaders, and from praising their people, and from invoking mercy upon their forefathers. So this was the repentance of Ibn Aqil. This was the repentance of Ibn Aqil. He made it public just like Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, rahimahullah. The Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he fell into huge amounts of confusion after sitting with Abu Ali al-Jubai, his stepfather who was a Mu'tazili. So towards the, uh, towards the year 300, you know, after spending nearly 40 years upon i'tizal and upon the ideas of the Mu'tazila and denying the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and denying the meanings of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being drowned in ilmul kalam in that speculative theology and theological rhetoric that he began to doubt the teachings of the Mu'tazila. He had a dream Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. He said that when I fell into that confusion, he said I used to have dreams where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to come to me. And he used to say to me, Ya Abu Hassan, abandon all of this. He said, what shall I do, Ya Rasulullah? He said, cling to the Athar. So he said, I abandoned all of that. And then I clung to the Athar, meaning to the narrations, to the Athar. To the hadith of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then he went out to the Jami to the to the Masjid al Jami, to the Jamia Masjid, to the large congregational masjid in Baghdad. And he stood upon the mimbar and he made his repentance, freeing himself from the Mu'tazila and Ahlul Kalam. And he said, I free and I free myself from them just as I removed this garment of mine and he removed his upper garment and he threw it on the ground. And then he wrote his repentance. And what is correct is that the last work that he wrote was Al-Ibana and Usul al diyana in which he mentioned that that which I'm upon now is that which Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a was upon. And anyone who opposes that which he was upon, then he is, admit, uh, he is a misguided, deviated innovator. This is the repentance of the one who repents from his deviation. As for, naam, as for this Aid al-Qarni, and there are many, many people like him. I think this is just a case study in Aid al-Qarni. That he didn't repent for anything else that he fell into or from the other affairs. From, for example, he's supporting the commemoration of the day 
that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated. He wanted a day to be established in Saudi Arabia. The day that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. On this day, the people should get, gather together and speak about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he started criticizing the Salafis for not celebrating it. He said, look, even those Sufis, they celebrate it. And you people, you don't celebrate the Hijrah of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the point that you need to be careful of, that when a person deviates and he opposes the manhaj, whether it be an Ash'ari, and remember Shaykh Al-Fawzan, Hafidahullah, he mentioned the Ash'ari who claimed to be Ahlul Sunnah. So those Ash'ari who claim to be Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'a, that they are in reality upon the Aqeedah of Abu Hassan before his repentance. And some of the scholars, the scholars, they differ with regard to the stages of the repentance of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. Were there three stages of repentance or two stages of repentance? But nevertheless, there was a stage in the life of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari that he was upon the aqeedah of Abdullah ibn Kullab. And this is what the Ash'aris are today upon. As for the Mu'tazila, then likewise the Shaykh has mentioned the Mu'tazila also. So anyone who repents from his bid'ah, whether it be a Khariji or a Sururi or a Qutubi or an Ikhwani or a Tablighi, and he was a caller to their way. They only openly used to call the people. Then his repentance should be open and clear, just as the repentance of Ibn Aqil, just as the repentance of Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, and other than them from those who repented from their innovations and misguidance. Even Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions in his Al Fatawa Al Hamawiyah. Al-Fatawa Al-Hamawiyyat Al-Kubra He mentioned that even some of the philosophers They repented And one of the examples that he uses Is Fakhruddin Al-Razi And Shaykh Muhammad Aman Jami He said that if it is the case that he If it is the case that he actually said these words That Shaykh Al-Islam narrated from him That he said that I found that That the pursuit of falsafa And the pursuit of kalam It does not bring any satisfaction or cure to the afflicted nor does it quench the thirst of the one who is thirsty rather the nearest path and the closest and the quickest path to success is the path of the Quran he said and anyone who experienced what I experienced and anyone who went through what I went through then they would know that so some of the scholars said that, it, that maybe towards the end of his life that Allah guided him to repentance but this is what is required when a person repents and you will come across many of these people say oh but he's, he's made tawbah for, for that made tawbah for what? open caller to innovation needs to repent openly as for the tasmiyah of salafiyya going back to that about the permissibility of calling oneself salafi then Al-Sheikh Al-Allama Abdul Aziz bin Abdullah ibn Ubaz, the great scholar, the Mujaddid and the Imam, Rahimahullah, he was asked a question, what do you say concerning the one who calls himself Salafi or Athari? Is this considered to be praise of oneself? Is it, to be, is it considered to be a tazkiyah? It's a meaning that if one calls himself Salafi or Athari, then it can be seen in the minds of the people or perceived in the minds of the people that he's praising himself. You're Salafi, mashallah. You, you're upon the way of the Sahaba. No one else is, only you. Because this is what they say. Why do you call yourself these names? Just call yourself Muslim. Then tell them, well, stop calling yourself Hanafi. Stop calling yourself Sunni. Because when it comes to Ahlul Sunnah, they say, we're Ahlul Sunnah. But you're not allowed to call yourself Salafi. Then why do you call yourself Ahlul Sunnah? Why not call yourself just Muslim? Meaning that in reality, it is not just a matter of them disliking the term Salafi. It is that they hate those who carry the, mad, the, the manhaj of, of, of the da'wah to Salafiyyah. They hate the carriers and the ascribers to this methodology of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. This is why you'll never find them criticizing the Tablighi or the Ikhwani or the, or the Ash'ari. They will say, oh, these names are, you know, common names in our times. They won't criticize them. Likewise, and those names themselves are names that are connected to innovation. Ashairah, Maturidiyya, Maturidiyya, 
شاعرة نكشبندية تشستية قادرية معتزلة all of these are names that are names of أهل البدعة titles of أهل البدعة and they won't criticize them they won't even criticize القائدة أو داعش many of them they won't criticize these titles but when it comes to using the term Salafi they say no no you can't call yourself Salafi Allah made us Muslims because there is an agenda behind why they don't want you to call yourself Salafi. Because they don't like the fact that you are distinguishing yourself with the truth. If you are distinguishing yourself with falsehood, they wouldn't mind. Because they know that the Salafi does not tolerate bid'ah. Once he, once he ascribes to Salafi in truth, he's not just a name that he's using. He's truly ascribing, him, ascribing himself to the Salafi manhaj and the Salafi da'wah. Then they know that you are ascribing yourself to something that is incorruptible. It is not possible to corrupt that methodology. So no matter what they come with, the Salafi will say, no, prove it to me from the Sahaba. No, prove it to me from the Tabi'een. No, prove it to me from the first three generations. This is what the Salafi will say. And this is what bothers them. So that's why they don't want you to use the term Salafi. As for themselves, they will say, yeah, he's a Sufi. They say, you don't have a problem with the term Sufi? No, no, no. That's, uh, many of the pious people used to call themselves Sufis. But I'm not allowed to call myself Salafi. No. We don't like these titles because they divide. Sufi doesn't divide. Naqshbandi doesn't divide. Look at the names of their masajid. Madrasa Naqshbandiya. Masjid of the Brailwiya. Uh, masajid of Jamaat al-Tablighi. Masajid of Ikhwan al-Muslimin. All of these titles and names, Chistiya, Qadiriya. But when it comes to Salafi, they have a problem. Because it is not in the, in the name itself, even though we can clarify why we call ourselves Salafi. As Shaykh al Islam has done, and we'll mention it later, and we'll, we'll continue to mention some of those narrations. But nevertheless, the problem is deeper than that. It is the fact that they, don't like, they do not like that the Mi'is, the, dis, the, the clarification, the distinction. That the Salafis bring to the da'wah. Our aqidah is aqidah salafiyah. What does that mean? It means our aqidah is the aqidah of the Sahaba. Our manhaj is the manhaj of the, sah of the Salaf. What does that mean? The manhaj of the Sahaba. Now let's bring Ikhwan al Muslimin. Who's your manhaj and where does it come from? Hassan al Banna, Sayyid Qutb, Qardawi. What about Jamaat al Tabliq? Where does your, man where does your da'wah come from? Where does your methodology come from? Ashraf al Ithanwi. And Muhammad Ilyas Kandahlawi and Muhammad Zakaria, Sufis and Quburis. So, if you don't have a problem with the usage of those titles, why would you have a problem with the usage of the title Salafi? Then we have those titles that are actually within the realms of Ahlu Sunnah from the, view, from the viewpoint of attaching oneself to a particular fiqh madhab in fiqh. Such as a person calling himself Hanafi. If he is truly Hanafi, meaning that he, is, he understands the madhab of the Ahnaf and what he is doing and when the truth comes to him, he will cling to the truth and not just blindly follow. Then we, haven't, we don't have a problem with this. Ibn Abil is al Hanafi. We don't have a problem. He's a Salafi Imam. Ibn Abil is al Hanafi died in 792, if I recall. Rahimahullah ta'ala. The, the one who explained the aqeed of Imam al-Tahawi rahimahullah ta'ala Hanafi Hanafi in what sense? in his aqeedah? no because the aqeedah of Ahl sunnah is one what do we mean by Hanafi? meaning that he is in terms of his fiqh then he is educated upon the madhab of the Hanafis likewise Shafi'iyah likewise the Shafi'iyah like Ibn Hajar was a Shafi'i rahimahullah likewise the Hanabila, and we mentioned the Hanabila last week. Those who are upon the madhab of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and they are the closest to Ahlul Hadith. In fact, they are Ahlul Hadith. The Hanabila of, of the early Salaf. And likewise the Malikiya. So therefore, the usage of those kind of titles or Al-Qab, Fulan Hanafi, Fulan Maliki, Fulan Shafi'i, if it is, for the purpose of ascribing oneself to the madhab that he studied and the madhab in general that he follows without blind following, then that is permissible. 
Do they have a problem with that? No, they don't. So why do you have a problem with Salafi? Because the madhab clings to one particular or attaches itself to one particular school of thought. Does it not? Who do the Salaf? The Salafi, what does he attach to? All of them. All of the early Salaf, we attach ourselves to them. From Abu Hanifa to Malik to Shafi to Ahmed to Fudail to Sufyan to Bukhari to Ibn Majah to Muslim to Abu Dawood to, to all of them. So why would you have a problem with a, you wouldn't have a problem with a person calling himself Hanafi and he attaches himself to one particular strand and we don't criticize that. Or to a Shafi'i. But you have a problem with one who attaches himself to all of that. And that was the madhab of the Salaf because that was the madhab of Abu Hanifa, Salaf. Abu Hanifa said, didn't say, I've said to my mother, all of you follow me, and those who follow me call yourselves Hanafis. Abu Hanifa ever say that? Shafi ever say that? Malik ever say that? The, these titles and these names that were ascribed to their imams came centuries later, or generations later rather. It wasn't said in the time of Ahmed, we are Hanabila. It wasn't said in the time of, the, of Abu Hanifa, we are the Ahnaf. It wasn't said in the time of Malik, we are the Malikiyya. Or the Shafi'iyya in the time of Imam, Imam Shafi'i. That was said generations later. Whereas the term Salaf was used by them. That's why Imam Abu Hanifa said, stick to the tariqah of the Salaf. Stick to the path of the Salaf. That's why Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, cling to the aqidah of the Salaf. That's why Imam Al-Awza'i rahimahullahu ta'ala said, hold or hold fast to the madhab of the Salaf. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah said what he said. So they have a problem with the usage of the term Salafi for more sinister reasons, because of an agenda. Not because the title itself, that they object to titles, because they are the, they are the worst of the people of earth amongst the Muslims, those who carry these titles. That's why you'll find an Ash'ari saying, I'm Ash'ari in Aqeedah, Hanafi in Fiqh, Naqshbandi in Tariqah, Ikhwani in politics. But they don't have a problem with that. We say we are Salafi in Fiqh. We are Salafi in Aqeedah. We are Salafi in Manhaj. We are Salafi in politics. We are Salafi in everything. In everything we are Salafi. But they have a problem with that. So you're out of those four things that he ascribes himself to, the only one that will accept as a correct ascription is Hanafi. If you're Ash'ari or Maturidi, you are upon Bid'ah. If you're Mu'tazili, you're upon Bid'ah. If you're Naqshmandi or, or Jisti or Qadri, you're upon Bid'ah. And then they say, and this is the, you know, the thing that, that sometimes you look and you don't know whether to laugh or cry. Hanafi in fiqh. Ash'ari maturidi in aqeedah. Sufi, naqshbandi, chishti or qadri or whatever he is in his tariqah. Tablighi or diobandi when he goes out to give da'wah. And then he says, and we are Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. What Ahlul Sunnah and what Jama'ah are you upon? Every, every point that you've mentioned divides the Sunnah and divides the Jama'ah. This is why Sheikh, Sheikh Islam, Abdul Aziz ibn Lubaz, he said when he was asked the question, when you call yourself Salafi or Athari, is this not just self praise? Is, is it not just a tazkiyah? So he said, if he is truthful in the fact that he is truly Athari or that he is Salafi, then there is no harm in him calling himself that. Just as the Salaf, just as the early Salaf, meaning the early scholars, they used to say, Fulan Salafi, so-and-so is Salafi, and Fulan is Athari. He said, this commendation, this Tazkiyah, la bud minha. It is a must that a person has it. It is a Tazkiyah wajiba. It is a commendation that is obligatory of, upon a person to have. And this is a lecture that the Sheikh gave, Rahimahullah, uh, in a sitting. The, uh, the, the lecture was called Haqqul Muslim, delivered in Ta'if, 
14th of the first in the year 1413. Then there is a statement of Bakr Abu Zaid. Bakr Abu Zaid said, if it is said, as Salaf or Salafiya, or that the path is Salafiya, or that their path is Salafiya, or that their path is Salafiya. He said, so this is an ascription. This is an ascription to the Salafus Salih, to the pious predecessors, i.e., all of the Sahaba and those who followed them correctly and precisely, excluding those who were deviated by the following of desires. So, the Salaf or the Salafis and Salafiyya refers to those who are Thabitun, meaning those who are steadfast and firm upon the methodology of prophethood. They were ascribed to their righteous Salaf in that. So they were called Salaf or Salafiyun. They were called Salafis, Salafiyun. And the ascription of one of them would therefore be Salafi, meaning that he would call himself Salafi. So based upon that, the term Salaf means the righteous predecessors. That's what the term Salaf means. And this term, when used in the general sense, refers to everyone who follows and emulates the Sahaba, even if that is in our times. And it is, as we have said, it is, as we have said, meaning that the Salaf were the Sahaba and those who came after them in the first three generations. The Salafi, the Ya at the end, which is Ya Nisbi, the Ya of connection or ascription is ascribed to the one who follows them and this is the saying of the scholars and this ascription does not fall outside of that which is necessitated by the book and the sunnah salafi is an ascription that cannot be separated from the first generations meaning the sahaba tabi'in and so on not even for a single moment the, rather it came from them and it leads back to them as for the one who opposes them with another label or another inscription or another title, then that is not from them, even if they had lived with them in their era. Meaning that if a person lived in the era of the Sahaba and he was a Qadari, can we call him Salafi? Even though he lived amongst the Sahaba, we can't call him a person of the Salaf or the righteous Salaf. So a person can live even in the time of the early Salaf, like in the time of Ahmed, in the time of Bukhari, in the time of Shafi'i and so on. But if he opposes the way of the Sahaba, he is not a Salafi, even if he lived among them. He's a Qadari, or he's a Jabari, or he's a Murji, or a Jahmi, or whatever he is, Kullabi, or whatever. So that's from Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid in Hukmul Intima. He also said, in one of his statements, in Hilyat al-Talibil, or Talib al-Ilm, he said, be a Salafi, kun Salafiyan ala al-Jadda. Be a Salafi, steadfast upon the path. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, this ascription is something that is established amongst the Salaf of this Ummah. And it is reported continuously in the books of biographies and narrators. Imam Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala stated in, his, in the biography of Muhammad bin Muhammad al-Bahrani. He said that he was religious. Kana dayyanan khayyaran salafiyyan. He was a religious, generous, charitable salafi. In Mu'jim al-Shiyukh, volume 2, page 280. Likewise in the tarjima of Ahmed bin Ahmed bin Ni'ma. He said, He used to be upon the aqeedah of the salaf. So ascription to the salaf is a must. So that the true salafi is distinct from the one who hides behind them. Hides behind the, meaning hides behind just the, just the idea of following the way of the salaf. 
And the reason why we distinguish ourselves, distinguish ourselves is, is so that the affair it does not remain ambiguous for the, ones, for the one who seeks to follow the early Salaf. So they want to ask, what are you? Say, I'm Salafi. What's a Salafi? Follows the way of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een. That's the Salafi. So it's a means of, of, of letting the people know that we are not Tablighi or Ikhwani or Diabandi or Sufi or Quburi or Takfiri or Daishi or, or from Al Qaeda or any of these sects. We are Salafi. What does that mean? We follow the way of the Sahaba. And we follow the way of the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of mankind is my generation. Then those who follow them, then those who follow them. The Prophet Sallallahu said this in a hadith in Bukhari. Furthermore, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not limit the term for the Muslims just to be Muslim. Because Muslim is the umbrella term that encompasses everyone who entered into Islam. All of the 73 sects. But then the Prophet ﷺ, when he described the 72 sects, he said all of them into the hellfire except for one. He said, al jama'a." He didn't say they are Muslims because they are all Muslims. So he distinguished the one sect by, by calling it the jama'a. So the Prophet ﷺ himself, ﷺ himself used the term jama'a. Referring to the one sect of Muslims that is different to the rest who are threatened with the hellfire. And he used the term in a narration, he said, Hum aswadul a'adham. They are the main body. That's another term that he used, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the main body. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma'ana alayhi liyawma ashabi. That which I and my companions are upon. Still he didn't use the term Muslim. Why? Because all of those sects are Muslim. But now he wants to distinguish the one sect with description and titles. So he describes them, Ma'ana alayhi liyawma ashabi, that which I and my companions are upon. That's the description that he gives them. Then he names them, al jamaa That's the title he's given them. Aswadul a'adham, the main body. That's the title he's given them. Ta'ifatul munsura in a hadith. La tazalu ta'ifatun min ummati. He called him a ta'ifa. There shall never cease to be a group, my ummah. A group, ta'ifa. Alal haq mansoorin. Mansoor. So they are ta'ifatul mansoora. So the Prophet wasallam used these titles to distinguish a sect that is upon the truth or a group that is upon the truth in opposition to the sects of deviation. So the term Salafi was used amongst the early generations. Muhammad ibn Khalaf well known as Waqi' died in the year 306 in his biography of Ismail bin Hamad rahimahullah he said Ismail bin Hamad ibn Abi Hanifa was a true Salafi Akhbarul Qudat volume 2 167 Imam al Dhahabi cited the saying of Imam Daru Qutni and Imam Daru Qutni Daru Qutni died in 385 so he is from the 4th century Imam Daru Qutni said there is nothing that I hate more than ilmul kalam than speculative theology or theological rhetoric then Imam al dhahabi commented this man Ad-Daru Qutni never spoke with theological rhetoric nor argumentation and he never entered into it rather he was a Salafi Seer Alam al-Nubala of Imam al dhahabi volume 16 657 and one can continue with more and more statements of those who used to ascribe themselves to the Salaf use the term Salafi and use the term Salaf so one should not be afraid of, of the usage of this term furthermore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in his book or rather before that that Jamal al-Harithi he said in this final sentence insha'Allah he said that when the deviated doctrines or the deviated madahib deviated madhabs become numerous and likewise the various ahzab hizbiyat that are astray and lead others astray then the people of haq should make clear and make apparent 
their connection and their ascription to the Salaf so that they may free themselves from those who oppose the way of the Salaf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he said to his Prophet and to the Mu'mineen فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَقُولُ اشْهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ From Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 64, that Allah said, So if they turn away, then bear witness. Meaning that you should say that if they turn away, meaning that the, 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 the Ahlul Kitab, because the whole ayah is referring to Ahlul Kitab, that if Ahlul Kitab turn away from Tawheed, then say, bear witness, that we bear witness, that we are Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded them to bear witness that we are Muslims, to differ from those who turn away from the truth, meaning here Ahlul Kitab. And likewise, the statement of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنَ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And who is more, and who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah and works righteous deeds? And then he says, indeed, I am from the Muslims. Again, distinguishing himself as one who has submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, that you free yourselves from misguidance and bid'ah. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 79. That this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the Prophets that they, have, that, that they said, وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ That I am not from the polytheists. So a person distinguishes himself with submission and, 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 and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Likewise, he frees himself from the people of misguidance. So a person says that I am Salafi and I am not Bid'i. I am a Salafi and I am not from Ahlul Bid'a. I am Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Afar upon the manhaj of the Salaf. And I am not from the Mubtadi'a. I am not from the Mu'tazila. I am not from the Khawarij. I am not from Ahlul Tasawwuf. I am not from the Murji. I am not from, from the people of the Jahum, the Jahmiya. Because the Salafi distinguishes himself. So all of these verses command the believer to be distinct from the people of falsehood as did the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the path of truth distinct from the path of falsehood wa jazakumullahu khairan walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam